six days of warfare in 1967 between Israel and its Arab neighbors are legendary for the staggering speed and fury of Israel's military victory. But the dreadful days of rage and trepidation leading to the outbreak of hostilities were no less dramatic. The Arab nations refused to accept Israel's presence. To the Arab mind, the humiliation of their defeat in 1948 could be removed only by soaking the Holy Land in the blood of its Jewish inhabitants. In the months before June 1967, calls for Israel's annihilation swelled into a hysterical battle cry on the streets of every Arab country in the Middle East. Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser stood at the heart of this incitement. A charismatic leader with appeal across the Arab world, Nasser campaigned for Arab unity and for the military destruction of Israel. His blood-curdling speeches were broadcast to every Arab nation, inflaming populations and shaping anti-Israel policy. Israel was a precarious sliver of land along the Mediterranean sand, barely 12 miles wide at her waist, and dwarfed by colossal foes in every direction. Egypt growled to her south, Jordan menaced her eastern border, and Syria rained mortars onto her north. These three nations commanded formidable standing armies and boasted hundreds of modern tanks, aircrafts, and artillery units. Additional Arab countries were prepared to offer varying degrees of commitment to any war against Israel, ranging from symbolic support to actual pilots, planes, tanks, and troops. Foremost among these were Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Kuwait, and Lebanon. Behind these loomed a larger foe, the Soviet Union, which armed and advised many of the Arab governments. Israel leaned on the support of a heavyweight but half-hearted ally, the United States of America. But President Lyndon B. Johnson, who took office in 1963, mired as he was in the Vietnam War, was more concerned with de-escalating the Cold War than addressing Israel's existential concerns. It was the Soviets who extended a lit match to the Arab powder cake that erupted in the 1967 Six-Day War. On May 13, 1967, the Soviets supplied Egypt with false intelligence, claiming that Israel has mobilized to invade Syria. They urge Egypt to take action, and in the first act of aggression, Nasser rolls his enormous Egyptian army into the Sinai Peninsula towards Israel's southern border. The Arab world erupts in euphoric celebrations and calls to slaughter the Jews. Nasser becomes an instant hero. Israel and the UN publicly clarify that Israel has not mobilized against Syria. But Nasser responds on May 15th by ordering the UN peacekeeping force that forms a buffer between Egypt and Israel to withdraw from Sinai. Israel's government is thrown into panic. UN Secretary General U Thant unilaterally orders his peacekeepers to comply with Nasser's demand. On May 19th, to Israel's horror and to the world's astonishment, the UN Emergency Force vanishes, leaving Israel exposed to a vast Egyptian force that would swell in just three days to some 80,000 troops and 600 tanks. Israel orders a large-scale mobilization of its army reserves and issues a stern warning that should Egypt close the Straits of Tehran to Israeli shipping, Israel will consider it an act of war and react accordingly. Meanwhile, the Arab world escalates its rhetoric. On May 18th, Cairo Radio broadcasts the following message. Every one of the 100 million Arabs has been living for the past 19 years on one hope to live to see the day Israel is liquidated. There is no life, no peace, nor hope for the gangs of Zionism to remain in the occupied land. As of today, there no longer exists the UN International Emergency Force to protect Israel. The sole method we shall apply against Israel is a total war, 
which will result in the extermination of Zionist existence. On May 20th, Syria's defense minister, Hafez Assad, declares, Our forces are now entirely ready, not only to repulse any aggression, but to initiate the act ourselves and to explode the Zionist presence in the Arab homeland of Palestine. The Syrian army, with its finger on the trigger, is united. I believe that the time has come to begin a battle of annihilation. And then it happened. On May 23rd, Egypt blockaded the Straits of Tehran to Israeli shipping in an act of war under international law. Israel's oil supply route is now cut off. No nation has rallied to Israel's cause. Mayor Amit, head of the Israeli Mossad, later recalled the tense days before the outbreak of the war. In the middle of the night, I received a visit from the CIA representative in Israel who said to me, if you shoot first, you will stand alone in this battle. Israel's military, intelligence, and civil leadership anticipate the worst. With Israeli men drafted into the army, the economy falters. Life grinds to a standstill. Students, housewives, and children dig trenches, build shelters, and volunteer for essential services. Anticipating record loss of life, Israel designates parks as mass cemeteries. A spirit of despair settles over the country's two million Jews, who whisper with dread of a second Holocaust. But Nasser is upbeat. He is ready for war. On May 26th, Nasser addresses the General Council of the International Confederation of Arab Trade Unions. We are ready to enter a general war with Israel. The battle will be a general one, and our basic objective will be to destroy Israel. On May 30th, King Hussein of Jordan signs a defense treaty with Egypt, placing the Jordanian army under Egyptian command. The Egyptian-Syrian-Jordanian axis is now complete. Ahmed Shukeri, chairman of the PLO in Jordanian Jerusalem, is asked in a June 1st news interview what will happen to the Israelis if there is a war. His response? Those who survive will remain in Palestine. I estimate that none of them will survive. The Arab military buildup continues. Egypt has 100,000 troops and 930 tanks in the Sinai, and another 110,000 soldiers and 450 combat aircraft on notice. Syria has 63,000 troops, and Jordan, 55,000. Israel's mostly civilian army is absurdly outnumbered in manpower, weaponry, planes, tanks, and artillery. Slightly more than two decades after the Holocaust, and less than 20 years since the United Nations resolution that authorized the Jewish people to create a state in their ancient homeland, the world had turned its back on the Jewish state and its population of survivors. There was no response to the Arab claim that the Jewish people are interlopers in their own land and have no right to the biblical land of Israel.